hearing will continue this subcommittee's focus on improving financial management throughout the Federal Government. Certainly want to welcome our, our witnesses and guests, and uh, up front want to say appreciate the um, uh, rearranging of everyone's schedule as we were originally planning to be with you last week. Glad uh, it worked out to be with you today. Um, the Department of Defense is the largest department in the Federal Government and spent $691 billion in 2010. Due to the size of its budget and the importance of its mission, it is imperative that DOD have proper financial management in place. DOD, unfortunately, has never been able to produce audible financial statements and has been on GAO's high-risk list since 1995 due to pervasive and systemic deficiencies regarding its financial management. In 2010, the Inspector General identified 13 areas of significant weaknesses in DOD's internal controls and financial management. Despite numerous financial reforms, DOD continues to be susceptible to waste, fraud, and abuse. It is particularly susceptible to improper payments. The amount of improper payments issued by DOD is not specifically known, but both GAO and the Inspector General have raised concerns and identified areas where improper payments are known to occur. In particular, the Inspector General's Office found that DOD was making significant overpayments in high-dollar programs, and that unless the Department improves its oversight, it will continue to make significant improper payments. In an attempt to improve financial management at DOD, Congress established a deadline to make all components of the Department ready to undergo a financial audit by 2017. This is a deadline that DOD is taking very seriously, and its efforts to improve financial management are admirable and certainly very much appreciated. However, there are numerous issues that the Department must address in order to be successful in meeting this deadline. To meet the deadline, DOD developed the Financial Improvement and Audit Readiness Plan. The plan is designed to improve and strengthen DOD's financial management through a series of gradual phases and benchmark goals. If the Department follows this plan successfully, it will be able to meet the deadline for audit readiness and significantly improve key weaknesses in its financial management. Successful implementation of the plan remains in doubt, however. Already, the Air Force has said it may have trouble meeting the 2017 deadline due to the fact that its financial management systems were created in the 1970s and need to be updated significantly. GAO and OIG have found that system Modernization is a challenge to DOD. There are also concerns that the Department may be able to devote, may not be able to devote enough resources. I'm sorry. There are also concerns that while the Department may be able to devote enough resources to successfully produce a one-time audible financial statement in 2017, it will not be able to develop systems sufficient to achieve audible statements on a continuing basis. And that, that's something I definitely will be looking to, to touch on in the sustainability of the improvements and in, in, um, uh, audible financial statements, not just a heroic effort to meet a one-time obligation. Strong financial management is crucial in order for a government to operate effectively, prevent waste, fraud, and abuse. DUD's increased focus on improving its financial management is, again, commendable and appreciated. Today we will hear from our witnesses about the challenges the Department faces in improving its financial management and producing audible financial statements. I certainly look forward to your testimony, um, and this, continue, uh, this committee looks forward to continuing to work with you to increase efficiency, accountability, and good financial management at the Department of Defense. Ultimately, improvements to DOD's financial management systems are critically important to protecting taxpayer dollars and most importantly, to ensuring that we maximize our nation's financial resources for meeting the needs of our warfighters in harm's way who defend our freedoms with great courage and dedication. And I, for yielding to the ranking member, would emphasize that while we will be discussing some of the challenges within the Department on financial management and how we can partner with you, I also want to recognize the heroic efforts of all of our men and women in uniform and all of our DOD civilian personnel who throughout the history of this nation and as we speak have been heroic on the front lines of democracy in defense of all of our freedoms and the uh, great blessings uh, we as Americans enjoy. And, uh, you know, um, if we uh, are more successful in financial management, we can even better support those men and women in uniform in, uh, in their heroic work. 
Uh, with that, I am honored to yield to uh, our ranking member, Mr. Towns from New York, for the purpose of an opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and also let me thank our witnesses for being here. These are tough times in America. People are losing their jobs, and many others can't find work. Programs that support those most in need are being cut in order to save money. Every family in America is tightening its belt and keeping a tight rein on the checkbook because it gets more difficult every day to stay solvent. These families have a right to expect that our government will do the same. For more than any other single government agency, it is the Department of Defense that justifies public skepticism about how their government stewards public funds, and it is the Department of Defense that this Congress should be holding accountable. The Department has been required to produce audible financial statements since 1997. We are now 14 years past this deadline, and the Department has still not met the requirement. This committee routinely examines the financial statements of other Federal agencies. In fact, 22 out of 24 agencies subject to the Chief Financial Officer, uh, subject to the Chief Financial Officer CFO Acts, have produced clean audits of their financial statements, but not DOD. I find it unacceptable that year after year a Federal agency that spends between two and three billion dollars every day cannot keep track of the money that the American taxpayers has entrusted to it. What's worse is that the problems exist even though the Department has over 2,200 separate business systems in place to help account for finances. Financial statements and unqualified audit opinions are excellent indications that an organization is performing efficiently. As Congress intends, unfortunately due to pervasive deficiencies in internal controls and financial management that would not be tolerated in any other Federal agency or the private sector as well, we cannot be assured that funds entrusted in the Department are spent prudently or even correctly. I hope that our witnesses today can shed some light on the current drive to generate financial statements at the Department of Defense that are audible. I am especially interested in hearing how the Department plans to keep the leadership engaged in the financial management overhaul until you achieve success. I also want to know how you are going to keep people on task day in and day out until the Department has audible financial statements. And most importantly, I would like to hear what the Department is doing to integrate its 2,200 separate business systems so that we don't have duplication and confusion that is currently present in your financial management structure today. The deadline for accomplishing this is exactly six years away on September the 30th, 2017. In the past, we have seen deadlines come and deadlines go with little change. Today we are joined by witnesses who are key players in helping the Department of Defense improve its financial management processes. I would like to thank you for your testimony in advance. And I'm looking forward to hearing how the current initiatives will be to bring permanent and successful change to the financial management process by the 27 deadline. And, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for staying with it to try and make certain that uh, we are able to get the information that we needed so people have confidence in what they are doing as well. Thank you very much. Now you are back. Thank the gentleman. And, um, uh, the, the ranking member and I have been uh, partners on this effort for uh, 
almost a decade now, because uh, when I chaired uh, from 02 or 03 to uh, the end of 06, and, and Mr. Towns was my ranking member, and then he chaired the subcommittee, and I was his ranking member, and now we switch places again, but um, we uh, we share uh, the um, focus on good good government and, and especially financial management, and in this case with the department. Uh, we will keep the record open for seven days for any of the um, uh, committee members who want to um, uh, submit their own uh, opening statements and for any extraneous material that we'll receive here today uh, or thereafter. Um, we certainly welcome our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Mark Easton, uh, who serves as Deputy Chief Financial Officer for the Department of Defense. Mr. Daniel Blair, who is the Department of Defense Deputy Inspector General for Auditing. And Mr. Asif Khan, Director of Financial Management and Assurance at GAO. Um, pursuant to our committee rules, if I could ask all three of you to stand and, and we'll swear you in. If you please raise uh, your right hands. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, thank you. You may be seated and let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Um, our, uh, our understanding is our floor schedule is we may have votes um, around 11 o'clock. And once we go over, we'll be over there for a long time. So what our goal is, is to hear your statements and then get to an exchange Q&A so we can have as productive um, exchange here this morning and conclude when we have to go over uh, for votes so that you're not kept waiting. Uh, and certainly uh, with you and your staffs, as well as with members and our staffs, uh, th this is um, kind of, the, I'll say, the public uh, front of uh, an ongoing effort to work with you. Uh, previously and, and going forward um, uh, staff to staff or members and staff uh, on this, uh, this important issue. And um, uh, while we're great, grateful for all three of you being here, uh, Mr. Blair, Mr. Easton, uh, I want to especially thank you for your prior service in uniform. Uh, and um, I love what I do, proud of what I do, but what I do pales in comparison to what you and all who have and are wearing the uh, uniform of our nation's armed services. So, again, thanks for your service. And with that, Mr. Easton, uh, if you'd like to begin. Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, Mr. Langford, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today on the subject of financial management within the Department of Defense. I have submitted a statement for the record, which I will summarize briefly this morning. As Deputy Chief Financial Officer, I am responsible to our Chief Financial Officer for financial policy, systems compliance, and internal controls, governing, governing financial and accounting aspects of our business operations across the defense enterprise. I have dealt with these matters in various capacities for more than 38 years, both in uniform and as a civil servant. I am proud to be part of a financial management workforce that is operating around the world, providing mission support to our warfighters. This team is also solving today's problems while being called upon to learn new skills and lead change. I also recognize that DOD financial management has remained on the GAO high risk list since 1995. In my experience, a reasonable level of controls exists across our enterprise, particularly at the local level. But in my current position, I also see enterprise-wide weaknesses that demand an enterprise-wide response. The lack of audible financial statements of DOD as a whole is a symptom of those weaknesses. To provide some amount of context for my comments, I wanted to, to cover DOD's financial management goals. First, we have to obviously acquire the resources that we need to, to meet national security requirements, and that is our budget role. Secondly, we have to ensure that we are using those resources legally, effectively, and efficiently, the execution side of our business, and that is an immense uh, challenge. That is where I spend my time and energy and where many of the challenges lie. And the third is to ensure that we have a world-class financial management workforce. To meet current challenges and to improve financial information and achieve audit readiness, we have adopted a new approach uh, with the team that we have in, 19, in 2009. We feel that that approach unites the enterprise around financial and asset information that we use every day to manage, specifically budgetary information and the physical existence and completeness of property. Previous DOD teams have tried, but with limited success, so it is fair to ask, why will this time be different? Simply put, we feel we have the right strategy, we have dedicated resources, we have absolute and solid leadership support and a governance process that will assign accountability for actions. 2017 is a long time from now, so we recognize that we have to show specific interim progress, and that is what, that's what we're, in fact, we're doing. One test 
already underway is our audit of the Marine Corps Statement of Budgetary Resources, which we will believe will result in a, in a, a positive audit opinion. When successful, this will be the first military service ever to achieve an audit of a single financial statement. But there are other events across the Department to include independent validation of specific things. For example, last month we completed an examination and validation by an independent public accountant of our funds distribution and control process, what we call appropriations received. That resulted, that segment resulted in a clean opinion. The Defense Information Systems Agency is in the process of auditing its, its fiscal year 2011 books. We expect a clean opinion in that audit. This year, our Defense Finance and Accounting Service, our primary service provider in that regard, conducted an audit of its civilian pay entitlement system and received a clean opinion. That system is used not only for defense but for several non-defense agencies. And finally, in July, we, we began, have not completed, but began an audit of the Air Force's funds balance with Treasury reconciliation process, an indication that we can reconcile, at least at the transaction level, our checking account statement. These are just a few examples. They build on past achievements, including auditable financial statements for the Army Corps of Engineers Civil Works Project and several defense agencies. We also have a number of large trust funds that are, that are currently auditable, and we will improve as we apply lessons learned from those recent experiences, as well as getting feedback from, from uh, the Government Accountability Office and DODIG. And I can assure you this is not the first time that, that this panel has met to work on this particular issue. However, there is an enormous amount of work still to do uh, to achieve and sustain auditable financial statements. Uh, it will require fundamental changes. Uh, the Government Accountability Office has identified significant uh, uh, specific challenges, and I wanted to talk to each of those. The first is leadership or tone from the top. We have implemented a governance structure early in the current administration, and it has kept the attention of senior leaders, and it, and it will continue to do so. Second is workforce competency. As I said, we have a dedicated and professional workforce who is on the job, doing the job, but financial audit competency is one that we need to continue to emphasize. Third is information technology. Many of our IT systems are old stovepipe designed to conduct basic budgetary accounting, but not to do the things that we need to do for full auditability. Improved systems alone, however, will not eliminate our weaknesses or guarantee auditable statements. Achieving auditability requires a consistent, a fourth element, a consistent level of internal controls, and that may be the key foundational thing that we uh, put as a priority. Looking ahead, we are determined to meet the congressionally mandated deadline of 2017. It is an ambitious but an achievable goal. However, we think that this time will be different. We have a Chief Financial Officer and Secretary Hale who has thoughtfully assessed and applied the lessons learned of many of those false starts that you alluded to, while also seeking the advice and counsel of external stakeholders and oversight activities. We also have the strong support and commitment of Secretary Panetta and anticipate an equivalent level of energy and interest throughout the Department. Finally, from my perspective, there is clear value and critical importance in the public confidence that auditability would demonstrate. Beyond that, the benefits to the Department, its mission, and to the taxpayers is very clear to me. This effort is, consist is consistent with the Administration's overall campaign to reduce waste across the government. The American people have always supported our men and women in uniform, but that does not relieve us from the obligation to ensure that we are managing scarce resources carefully and effectively. We are committed to doing so. This commitment will be especially helpful in reinforcing our current efforts to combat improper payments. We have a solid program, but our reported results are questioned because of the many weaknesses that have, have been discussed. In summary, we recognize the challenges associated with improving financial management in the Department. To meet those challenges, we have developed promising partnerships across the enterprise to include our new chief management officers as well. We have implemented a new focused approach that includes near-term goals in addition to the long-term goal of achieving auditable financial statements by 2017. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I, I appreciate your comments and support for our men and women in uniforms, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Easton. Mr. Blair. Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, and Mr. Lankford, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to appear today before you on behalf of the DODIG to discuss financial management challenges facing the Department. These challenges prevent DOD from collecting and reporting financial information that is accurate, reliable, and readily available for decision makers. 
Over the past few years, the Department has worked diligently to address its financial management challenges. However, more progress is required to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money. Today, I will discuss three key challenges that must be addressed before DOD will be able to demonstrate sound financial management through a financial statement audit. First, improving data reliability. Second, improving internal controls. And third, effectively implementing new systems called Enterprise Resource Planning Systems, or ERPs. Reliable data are essential to making sound business decisions. However, we frequently identify financial data that are inaccurate and unreliable. Since fiscal year 2007, we have issued 89 reports that highlight data quality problems. Our audit of the controls over the Army's deployable disbursement system, contain, which contains key information for $13 billion of commercial payments, found that the system did not have reliable data for over 73 percent of the transactions that we reviewed. Significant improvements must also be made in DOD's internal controls. As you know, these controls are the first line of defense to safeguard assets against fraud, waste, and abuse. Currently, longstanding internal control weaknesses are affecting the Department's ability to obtain a clean audit opinion. In addition, without strong internal controls, the Department is at high risk of making improper payments. In fiscal year 10, the Department reported nearly $1 billion in estimated improper payments. However, DOD's estimation process did not review more than half of the first quarter of FY10 gross outlays, and therefore we question the reliability of this estimate. Simply stated, the Department does not consistently know that it is paying the right person the right amount at the right time. Our audit of a contract supporting the Broad Area Maritime Surveillance Program found that the DOD personnel did not validate that the contractor was entitled to receive over $329 million because none of the invoices were reviewed. My written statement for the record includes copies of two actual invoices that were paid under this contract. Effectively implementing the Department's new ERP systems is a key component of its auditability strategy. These new systems are intended to eliminate many old legacy systems, provide useful, timely, and complete financial management data. However, unless the Department first improves its data quality and reengineers its underlying business practices, many of the intended benefits of these new systems estimated to cost over $9 billion between fiscal years 10 and 17 will not be realized. We have also noted that the milestones for four of the 11 ERP systems have, has begun to slip. Further, we are concerned that other milestones for, com for completing critical financial management improvement efforts are very close to the FY17 deadline. Full deployment of some ERPs, as well as asserting audit readiness of the Statement of Budgetary Resources, will not happen until fiscal year 17, as some critical components will also not be validated prior to this date. Any delay in these milestones will likely prevent the Department from meeting its goal. In closing, sound financial management is critical to providing effective stewardship over the billions of dollars that the Department receives annually. DOD must continue to improve data quality and its internal controls in order to reduce its vulnerability to improper payments. While I recognize the significant effort that DOD leadership has put forth to resolve these longstanding financial management problems, frankly, much more remains to be done. Senior leaders in the Department and the Congress need reliable, timely financial information in order to make accurate decisions and to ensure that they, every dollar spent actually supports the warfighter and improves military readiness. This concludes my statement today. I would be happy to take any questions that you may have for me. Thank you, Mr. Blair. Mr. Kahn. Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, and Mr. Langford, good morning. Thank you for uh, having me here. It is a pleasure to be here to discuss DOD financial management and some of the issues they are facing in terms of getting auditable. At the outset, I would like to thank you for holding this hearing. Focused attention is necessary to be able to solve these challenges. In my testimony today, I will discuss the status of DOD financial management weaknesses and its effort to resolve them, the challenges DOD continues to face in improving its financial management operations. My testimony is based on our prior work at DOD. Regarding the status, for more than a decade, uh, like Congressman Platt, you mentioned, DOD has dominated GAO's list of 
programs and operations uh, at high risk due to their vulnerability to waste, fraud, and abuse, and, and mismanagement. In the last 20 years, as a result of significant financial management weaknesses, none of the DOD military services, the Army, Navy, or the Air Force, have been able to prepare auditable financial statements. DOD past strategies for improving financial management have generally been ineffective, but recent initiatives are encouraging. Changes to DOD's plan, the Financial Management Improvement and Audit Readiness Plan, the FIRE plan, if implemented effectively, could result in improved financial management and progress towards auditability. DOD faces many difficult challenges in overcoming its long-standing financial management weaknesses. I will hi highlight five of these significant challenges. First, one of the toughest challenges is sustaining committed leadership. DOD's Comptroller has expressed commitment to the FIRE goals and has established a focused approach to achieving long-term goals that, if implemented correctly, will include interim goals to provide the opportunity for near-term successes on the way to long-term goals. However, within every administration, and of course between administrations, there are changes in senior leadership. Therefore, it is paramount for the FIRE plan and other current initiatives to be institutionalized at all working levels within DOD. Second, weaknesses in DOD's internal controls over financial management are pervasive and a primary factor in departments' inability to become auditable. DOD has efforts underway to address known internal control weaknesses. However, their effectiveness has not yet been seen. As discussed in our recent report, because of the lack of effective internal controls, the DOD in Inspector General disclaimed the opinion on the Marine Corps' fiscal year 2010 Statement of Budgetary Resources, the SBR. The third challenge I want to cover is competent financial management workforce. With, with the right skills and um, knowledge to implement the FIRE plan, analyzing the skills needed and building and retaining such workforce are important actions now to ensure continued progress in implementing the goals of the FIRE plan. The fourth challenge is to assure accountability and effective oversight. To improve efforts, DOD and its components have established senior executive committee and designated officials at appropriate level to oversee financial improvement. It will be critical for senior leadership at each DOD component to ensure that responsible officials are held accountable to their component's progress. We recently reported that Navy and the Air Force oversight of their implementation plans was not effective resulting in their incorrectly asserting that they were ready for audit. Both the DOD IG and the Comptroller made the final decision correctly to determine the plans were not ready. Fifth, enterprise resource planning or ERP systems are expected to form a core of business information systems and DOD components. According to DOD, their successful implementation is not only critical for addressing long-term weaknesses in financial management, but equally important for helping to resolve weaknesses in other high-risk areas, such as business transformation, business system modernization, and supply chain management. The components, however, have largely been unable to implement ERPs that deliver the needed capabilities on schedule and within budget. In a preliminary result from a current review, we identified issues related to ERPs deployed to DFAS, the Defense Finance and Accounting Services, by the Army and the Air Force. DFAS users of the ERP told us they needed to devise manual workarounds and software applications to perform routine tasks. To the degree the ERPs do not provide intended capabilities, the goal of DOD-wide audit readiness by fiscal year 2017 could be in jeopardy. In closing, I am encouraged by the recent efforts and commitment DOD leaders have shown towards improving the Department's financial management. However, DOD continues to face significant challenges, and success may depend on DOD's ability to sustain and increase its current efforts, commitments, and momentum. Congressional oversight will play an indispensable role in assuming continued progress, and I commend you for holding this hearing. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I will be happy to answer any questions that you or the other members may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Uh, we will move into uh, questions, and uh, I yield myself five minutes to begin. Um, just a, a statement up front, uh, Mr. Easton, your um, uh, written statement, and you said to here today, something that jumped out to me is, uh, quote, uh, why will this time be different? And, and I think that is something that the ranking member and I because of, of for almost 10 years of being involved in these issues, your acknowledgement that 
you know, we've, uh, we've heard some good, encouraging words in the past. We've spent, uh, seen, uh, as with you know, Dimer's, uh, over a billion dollars spent on the issue, uh, yet here we are still uh, struggling to move forward. And, um, and I'll get into, if we have time a little later, you know, have uh, one branch uh, already saying six years out that they don't think they can meet the deadline, uh, which I, I, that does concern me also from a leadership standpoint that they're saying that, you know, um, yeah, hey, we, uh, we saved the world in World War II in four years, yet we can't, you know, get our books straight in another six years. Um, but uh, I want to start with first the importance of, of this issue and why it's so important. Well, you, know, um, you know, our hearings are, are not sexy, uh, glamorous, exciting hearings, but they are so important because they're about American people's money, how it's being handled, and in this case, how we make sure those funds are available for the warfighter. Uh, Senator Coburn put out earlier this year um, a uh, report on deficit reduction entitled uh, Back in Black, and he referenced in there that the Marine Corps, through improved financial management, had saved an estimate about $3 for every $1, uh, uh, $3 savings in, for every $1 they spent on uh, those improvements. Uh, across the, the government, it actually uh, seems to be about 10 to 1 savings. So if we, if we extrapolate that, we're talking probably at least $25 billion or more um, in annual savings in just the Department of Defense. And, and given that um, we're uh, moving through uh, cuts of over $400 billion to the Department in the coming 10 years, and perhaps further cuts uh, as part of the uh, Budget Control Act, these type of savings are critically important. Um, uh, I guess, Mr. Easton, I ask you, do you, do you think that's uh, Senator Coburn's number of at least three to one savings and perhaps as high as 10 to one uh, is uh, a legitimate number when we talk about what we may be able to save if we're successful in this effort? I'd be, I'd be reluctant to specifically commit to a number. Uh, I think that there's clearly value in the importance of doing this. For example, the Marine Corps has already demonstrated out-of-pocket costs relative to reducing their bill for finance and accounting services. I think that there's been identified in their business practices where they've become aware of how to use that, inf the, the, those doll that information in a more timely manner to ensure that they can do that. So, uh, so I am absolutely confident that the value is there. I'd be reluctant, as I said before, I try to stay on the financial execution side of the House, but that value proposition, I think, internally uh, is one that we need to look very seriously at and act upon. The, um, yeah, and, and I, um, if, if even if it's half of that estimate and it's 10 to 15 billion uh, in today's tight, in any uh, economy, in any time, that's real money. It's the people's money, and especially in a tight economy um, and where we have, you know, trillion dollar plus deficits uh, each and every year now. Absolutely, yes, sir. Um, Mr. Blair, I want to, uh, again, kind of start in the, more of the big picture. Uh, the FIRE, the, the Financial Improvement Audit Readiness uh, Plan, is so critical here. And it's kind of the, the game plan. How do we get to, you know, clean audit uh, 2017? Um, given that, um, I, I was, I guess, discouraged by um, the, the reports uh, from GAO that, uh, and I think Mr. Khan just referenced uh, Navy and Air Force, uh, in at least two of the financial improvement plans that they've looked at, um, you were done not in compliance with the guidelines of FIRE. And uh, not only were they not done in compliance with the guidelines, which, again, are the critical game plan here, um, but the uh, oversight that was put in place to try to make sure the compliance occurred, the oversight didn't occur from what GAO's report finds. So um, from your perspective as IG, and then Mr. Easton, and I, uh, your, yours as well, um, that's not encouraging. A a am I missing something here, uh, or are, are we off to a, a not a, a good step in this area given the, the failure to comply with the fire um, guidelines? Uh, Mr. Platts, I think that the, the key point here is uh, the oversight that we provided over those fire package, uh, fire assertion packages, um, it correctly concluded that the department wasn't ready. We found in some situations that the department's initiatives to review their business processes identified areas that need to be corrected. Those corrective actions hadn't been implemented 
yet the assertion continued to move forward, <clears throat> and the Department continues to say we are audit ready. Um, and so I think we appropriately stepped in and said, stop, we don't think you are ready. And, and I think what is happening now is that there is a learning process going on, and the Department is actually taking the, the, um, the results of its own review processes, the feedback that we give them, they are taking it very seriously. And they are now looking at what further improvements do we need to make before we come back and say, yes, we are ready for an audit. And, and Mr. Eason, maybe that is, if you can touch on what Mr. Blair just said, um, the, given that these are kind of early ones, they were identified as, as uh, challenges or problems, um, how do we make sure and are, are we taking proactive steps that the lessons of those FIPS not being in compliance, not being properly handled, moving forward anyways, that we're, we don't continue to repeat those errors, because if we do, 2017, 2027, we'll be here, you know, when I've already got a lot of gray hair, but, you know, more gray hair and still be talking the same <coughs> issues. So how, how do we learn from those mistakes and not repeat them? We spend a lot of time in terms of trying to cross-fertilize, both at a senior level from a governance perspective as well as a, as a, a working level, to be able to, to learn from what we found from the Marine Corps audit, learn from those packages. In both of those packages that GAO identified, we had, in fact, as Dan said, basically said that you were not ready. Uh, and, and so I think that what we're trying to do now, it goes back to the, uh, a little bit of the competency issue. And I say competent meaning our people are some of the best people in government. I can assure you of that. But at the same time, from a financial audit perspective, we don't have that skill set. We're not viewing it uh, in the way uh, that a financial audit needs to view it and that management needs to view it. And so we're trying to be able to get in on the, as early on in those things to be able to sort of murder board this up front to make sure that they are going to go into those processes and apply the lessons up front. So that is what we are doing in that regard. I, I want to yield to the ranking member a, a quick follow-up. I know you have put in place, a, a, in essence, a certification program to try to get your, your financial, financial management personnel more up to speed, as I will say. Is, is, is this going to be part of that, um, you know, that uh, you know, they, they understand the, the role that the fire compliance uh, you know, the guidelines play and that as they move forward, they need to be looking to make sure they are in line with it? That is absolutely one of the key components. I guess the two things, the two real key things in the certification program we want to emphasize, this is one of them, to ensure that the quality of the information is, is good. And the second is, uh, is analytical skills so that we can get the most out of the program. And, and so we will be including that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yield to the uh, gentleman from New York. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I want you to just elaborate a little further, uh, Mr. Easton, as to why this time is going to be different. You know, I, I, I want to hear more about that. I think that the, what we have done in the past, because uh, I, I have been involved, this is sort of a second career opportunity for me. Having been in the Department of Defense for 38 years, I spent most of my time in the logistics community. And so I was an operator. And as I got into the financial management community, one of the things that I found is that I had a much different perspective uh, of what I thought financial, the quality of our financial information when I was in the logistics community that what I, when I was working in the financial management community. So the key issue that I would like to use, using that as an example, you know, we have been trying to tackle this too much in the past as a financial management issue. It really reflects a weakness in our business enterprise. And so every contracting officer, every logistics officer, every, um, uh, every personnel officer needs to understand how they do their job affects uh, money uh, and financial information. And so in focusing on the information that we all can agree upon, typically budgetary information or in logistics property, I think we are trying to bring those communities together. And so I would characterize that as our primary weakness in past attempts. And that is why I think that this strategy will work. Thank you very much. Um, because I want you to know that this is not one of those I got you committees. You know, we, this is one of those I want to help you committees. You know, and so that's the reason why you know we keep staying with this and seeing in terms of uh, what we might be able to do. However, it is encouraging that you know uh, President Obama and Secretary Panetta have singled out financial management improvement as a top priority at the Department of Defense. Uh, to quote the Secretary, it is unacceptable to me that the Department of Defense cannot produce a financial statement that passes all financial 
audit standards that will change, he said. I have directed that this requirement be put in place as soon as possible. America deserves nothing less. As long as leadership remains engaged, I can see this process going forward. Unfortunately, however, within every administration, there are changes in senior leadership. And I am happy to hear that you have been around for 38 years. I uh, am happy to hear that. Uh, which interrupts their involvement in financial improvement initiatives. Sometimes the interruptions are severe enough to derail the entire process. GAO recommends that current initiatives be institutionalized throughout the Department at all working levels. In order for success to be achieved, and I want to guess to go to you, Mr. Khan, since this is your recommendation, please explain how you institutionalize financial management improvement so that it withstands changes at the senior level, who comes or who goes, that regardless that this will continue to move forward. Uh, Mr. Town, that also touches upon oversight and accountability. Um, that is going to go a long way to help institutionalize the tenants of the fire plan and bettering the financial management within DOD. Um, like we had mentioned in our report, one of the issues with the oversight of the two accessible units at the uh, Navy civilian pay and the Air Force existence and completeness was that the oversight and responsibility at the ground level, there was uh, not really adequate acknowledgement that they were not really uh, uh, following the fire guidance. Once the oversight and uh, the responsibilities are firmly institutionalized, there will be much more, uh, uh, much more of check and balances within the governance structure to make sure that things are not moving forward unless they are actually being done. Let me ask you this. Um, do you think that the staff that is in place are really capable of carrying out this mission. You know, um, sometimes we ask people to do things and uh, that they just can't do. And based on our own salary scale, we watched that over the SEC, uh, that where we had people who um, were making very little money and competing with people that were making tons of money. And, um, and of course, um, the stability in terms of the workforce was not good because people would stay a little while and then leave. Um, do you see this as being a part of this as well? Um, like, a, like I mentioned in my testimony, uh, competency of the financial management workforce is very important for two reasons. Uh, DOD financial management is complex from a technical perspective. Uh, working in those antiquated systems is not easy. DOD is a complicated environment. So therefore, uh, training, uh, getting the right skill sets uh, to be able to address the current challenges is critical. Uh, it's I mean, we haven't done specific work on the competency of the skill sets. However, there was a requirement from the National Defense Authorization Act of 2008 for DOD to go and do a skill set, set assessment under many different functions, financial management being one of them. And that's an area which was not done, and I think it's being repeated again in the National Defense Authorization Act of 2011 that they go back and address the financial management skill set issue. That's going to go a long way to answer the question that you have, sir. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I know my time has expired, but let me, I guess to you, Mr. Easton, you know, um, when we stopped the draft, we had to create a bonus situation to be able to keep certain folks in the military that we need with these essential kind of jobs. Do you think that maybe we need to do something like that here, the, the whole people that, uh, that we need and that can help us with some kind of bonus program or something to, because, you know, this bothers me, the fact that, you know, um, we don't know how much money, I mean, you know, and I'm looking at this, uh, this voucher here. I mean, this is very disturbing. I'd like to get your answer on that, and, I, and my time has expired. The, if I could redirect, I, I guess the, several of those things, in my estimation, tie together. I think that the key to really institutionalizing this is people, as you, as you mentioned. I think we absolutely have the capability in, in our people to be able to, to do this. 
Uh, I think that we need to ensure that we're not just talking at a senior level. We need to begin to institutionalize this by ensuring uh, that, on the one hand, we're bringing people with the skill sets in from, from the private sector. That's, that's one thing that we're doing. I think that we need to, we need to factor this into the training programs. Uh, there may be some opportunities to use bonus things like that, but, but at the same time, you know, I, we were, we were uh, at another, uh, another session and Congressman Conaway mentioned that he was in the field and, and uh, a, a soldier, I think, had, had mentioned that he is getting the word. And so, you know, we need to, through training, we need through to communication, be able to get the word so that we are just not, this is not just a Pentagon program. This is a program that has got to be driven into the field. And I think the institutionalization, as well as the leadership perspective, but we have really got to get the word out. It has to become part of our DNA and culture in DOD. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Langford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, all for being here. I am sure this is your favorite part of the week. You have been looking forward to it all week, thinking I can't wait till Friday and can do a congressional committee. And I appreciate your work and your service for staying on top of this. You probably spent a lot of time in a quiet office digging through financials and, and trying to track these things. So I appreciate your work on it. Um, you men know we have the finest military in the world. No one does it better than us. No one's ever done it as good as we do it. Uh, we can park a satellite on the horizon and look through a tent and tell you exactly what's in it, but we can't track our finances. Uh, that is a focus on leadership, and I, I've appreciated everyone mentioning it. It's just this consistent focus of if we're going to get this done, we've got to focus on this and get this done. And I do commend the President, and I do commend Leon Panetta coming in and saying this has got to be a focus priority. You're all saying the, exactly the same things. So I appreciate that. Uh, it is a focused leadership to be able to, to get this thing accomplished. I do want to get a chance to, to ask a couple of specific questions. So, Mr. Easton, you mentioned financial controls. In fact, all of you at some point mentioned something about financial controls. Give me some specific ideas that you are looking at at this point to saying we can improve financial controls by doing these things. So you have specific things already on radar for that. We are going at uh, the key processes. I mean, civilian pay. I mean, something as simple as civilian pay where we look at uh, and identify key controls. We try to standardize the processes as much as we can, but we identify key controls that, that even if the time and attendance systems may be different, we have people thinking the same way to be able to implement key controls and, and be able to use them. Uh, as well. You know, having a control is one thing, but actually being able to do that. So civilian pay, military pay, um, yeah, in the procure-to-pay process, how we write contracts, and some of the issues that uh, that uh, that uh, Dan mentioned in terms of the contracting process. This is really a team sport. It's not just a financial issue. It's an issue of how we write contracts, how we administer contracts, and and keeping the focus on those controls throughout the process. And so those are a couple examples uh, that I would offer. And so it's, it it really is pretty basic, and it amounts to doing your job on a day in and day right. out basis. It is right. training the people. It is knowing what is the job, what is the task, and training people for that. Uh, and that is why it is challenging for me to look at it and say six years out, there is still some hesitancy to say can we get there in six years when it is the basics of defining out what the job is and training people to be able to do the job. And, and I think and, and several people mentioned the Air Force is, is, is a high risk, has identified some concerns with risk. I, I think that they link uh, and it is important to link the investment in our systems uh, to, to this process as well. But getting back to the basics, I think, is something that we can do that will support this as well as to increase the likelihood that we will successfully uh, do that system. But we, we have had a problem in the past where we tend to look for a silver bullet. Uh, and, and when we look in the mirror, I think it is just a question of doing the basics well. Okay. Other comments about dealing with financial control, specific ideas on that, what has to be done? Uh, Mr. Langford, I just want to leverage a little bit more on what Mr. Easton just said. Really, financial management goes way beyond the, the traditional bean counters. And if you look at how the Department executes a lot of its missions, it is done through primarily contracts. And one of the things that is a consistent theme in my testimony is the lack of effective contract oversight, effective contract administration. When so much of your money is going out that way and you don't have a good process in place to review the, all of the vouchers, um, and you don't have good edit checks in your systems to make sure that everything is done efficiently. Those are two areas that I think the Department could significantly benefit from. Is that the training of the contracting officer, or is that training of the person that is next after the contracting officer? Where is the gap there? It, sir, it's, the gap is in both locations. It is the contract officer level when it comes to 
putting the contract in place, but it is also the contracting officer's representative who is the person on the ground that is supposed to be doing that oversight. Because we have had, obviously, numerous issues with the contracting officer writing on a contract, putting it out there, and then as we go along, then the definitions change and the price skyrockets as the definitions of what we are really looking for change. So we really didn't get a good definition at the beginning. And I am quite confident many of these systems are very complicated. It is hard to get it right the first time on things as we go along. But it is also difficult when everyone, as you go along, says, oh, I would like to also add this, and what have we thought about this, and can we change this? So is that a matter of getting contracting right at the beginning, I say again? Uh, is that the bigger of the two issues, or is the bigger issue the person that is behind it? I, I don't think you can look at one as being bigger than okay. the other. I think they are both equally important. The requirements have to be correct in the beginning, and the oversight throughout the contract process has to be effective. Uh, just to add to what Mr. Easton and Mr. Blair have mentioned, I think it is very important to have a baseline of all the internal control deficiencies currently to be able to build on. And secondly, just like Mr. Blair has just mentioned. Well, I am sorry to interrupt. Is the, is the baseline, does the baseline like, like that exist? Not, not that we know of. Okay, so uh, at, this, at this point, part of the issue is just writing out where do we have the problems. At absolutely. This point. And that is part of the, one of the basic uh, fire plan tenants that they have to do the discovery process. So that's it's and we're set to have that part of the process complete by when. Obviously, getting the full list of where do we have problems precedes solving problems. I think I think that we go through the uh, the discovery process, but in 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 each of the segments. I mean, I think in many cases each of the components you, focusing on that have broken it up into segments, and so those processes may take place at various times. I guess I would emphasize too. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's a process of really looking in the mirror and finding out how you're doing business today. I, I would assert that, that we have more control than we are willing to present. Uh, and it's a question of stepping back and looking at, at how we do business. And I can give you some examples in that regard, but we clearly have to do that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Conway. Just to add to that, just like Mr. Easton and Mr. Blair have mentioned, I mean, many of these uh, transactions originate in non-financial areas. Therefore, it's critical. The systems are going to be critical. Uh, the sooner they're implemented, this end-to-end -end process uh, of a particular transaction cycle is going to be uh, put into place. Controls are going to change along with the new systems. So the sooner these systems are implemented, the better it's going to be. And it's going to go a long way to addressing the control weaknesses that we have right now. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Gentlemen, I appreciate that very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your patience with me going a little bit long. Uh, no, no problem. We, we're our, because um, we, we still haven't had any uh, vote bells go off, we're going to continue for uh, uh, my colleagues who, who um, if your times allow, have a second round, if, if you like. Um, I'm going to uh, kick it off. Um, on before a question just uh, or on a specific issue of improper payments, uh, Mr. Easton, you, you mentioned in your, in your uh, testimony and, and uh, Secretary Panetta uh, taking a very hands-on approach to this, the importance of financial management and improvement, and you referenced that you are uh, kind of preparing an update for him uh, where things stand and what your plans are, uh, maybe similar to what you are sharing here today. but. Um, I guess what is the time frame for that to be provided, and if it's possible for um, um, a copy or, or a summation of, of what those plans are, if, if it's possible to have it shared with the, com the committee as well, I think it would help us as we try to partner with you so we're all on the same page. Absolutely. I, I, we're, uh, we're in the process, uh, Secretary Panetta and, and, uh, and Mr. Hale are, are reviewing our current status and plans, much of the same things that we've talked about today. Uh, and so we would anticipate, I don't want to get out too far in front of, of my boss or his boss, uh, yeah. but we would certainly uh, uh, want to share those with, uh, with you and the committee. Uh, that would be great. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, turn to a specific issue of improper payments. Um, you know, uh, across the government, the official uh, number most recent is $125 billion. I mean, and when, I, when I share that number back home, you know, my, my, uh, my fellow citizens think I misspoke. Uh, you know, that every year we are making improper payments of at least that. We, you know, we think the real number is probably at least $200 billion, um, because we don't account for, for maybe every uh, uh, improper payment made. When it comes to DOD, um, I know, Mr. Easton, you, you I think, reference a, a 1 to 2 percent uh, rate, uh, which even if, if for, for in comparison that would be a good percent, but given we are talking a you know, $550 billion, uh, that would still be billions of dollars of improper payments within the one department. But I, I guess what I, I want to is, um, is uh, Mr. Reeson, you, you highlight that 
as a, a strength of where you are doing well. Mr. Blair, Mr. Khan, IG, GAO raised some specific concerns that, um, that there is not a real ability to accurately assess if that is uh, uh, the, the, the right amount, 1 to 2 percent, and, and specifically that there are uh, hundreds of billions of outlays that were not assessed at all. Uh, and so how do we know what the real number is? So um, I, I guess, um, Mr. Eason, we can start with you, how you think you come up with your number uh, of that 1 to 2 percent, and then, Mr. Uh, Blair and Mr. Kahn, if you could reference your concerns and, and where, you, where you differ here. We have about six major programs. DFAS, uh, our finance and accounting operation, disperses about 90 percent uh, mm -hmm. of our dollars. And so there's, there's five or six primary programs that they report upon uh, as well. Many of our payments, uh, many of our payments are recurring payroll-related payments, contract payments. Admittedly, some of them are very, very complex. The two areas of difference, I mean, you know, we have to, I have to acknowledge the fact that, you know, lacking a clean audit opinion, lacking and acknowledging comprehensive controls, there are weaknesses. I would, I would say that we, that we try to compensate for those weaknesses to the maximum extent possible and report accurately in each of those numbers. And that is why I consider it a strength. However, the two areas of difference, just to, uh, to mention two, is in the commercial pay area because of the difficulty uh, and, and, you know, we put so much emphasis in prepayment audits, we had not moved into a statistical sampling. And a lot of your $125 billion is, is driven by legitimate statistical sampling. That was a point GAO was brought up with us at the time. OMB was, uh, was on board with, with our, our approach. Uh, we have since changed that. And so we have closed that one particular gap. The issue uh, relative to the, uh, the DODIG report, and, and Mr. Blair will comment more on that, was, was uh, uh, the, there was about 100 and I want to say uh, 130 billion, I believe, that were not included. Uh, much of that number represented a transfer payment into a trust fund, and, and, and their point was accurate. In other words, we should be able to reconcile all outlays. Uh, but the, some of the outlays that were considered saying we excluded them were not intended to be included uh, in that. And it was a difference of opinion, admittedly, between uh, us and the, and the IG. Mr. Blair? Uh, Mr. Easton is correct that, that we do differ on, on some of these, these issues. Um, there are some areas where the Department did not do a very good analysis or, no, or did not do an analysis at all. And it really focused a lot in the contract and commercial payments areas. And as I indicated before, that is where so much of the Department's dollars are going. With regards to the transfer, you know, was it a transfer or was it not a transfer, what we said to the Comptroller staff is, uh, you know, we would like to see a reconciliation so that you can show us what was a transfer, what was a real disbursement or a payment uh, of a bill that was owed. And, and one of the things that we wanted to do with our report was to say, here are some ideas that we think you can incorporate in your next estimate methodology. Um, the results of, of DCAA's audits, the results of our audits, those oftentimes point to areas where vulnerabilities exist. And the other thing that the Department can do is expand its methodology to look at the, the, the instances where they offset a future contract payment because of a prior improper payment or overpayment amount to include the results of, of when EFTs, the electronic fund transfers, are rejected because it went to the wrong place. That's, the, that's another indication that it's an improper payment. And also to look at where there are recalls. <clears throat> and a recall is a situation where the Department can go in and take the money back out of the bank account. All of those are specific areas that weren't included, that if they were included, would help develop a more robust methodology. And as I indicated before, uh, you don't know unless you look. And so the more introspection that the Department has, the better they are going to be able to include or improve their controls. Mr. Kahn, before you uh, answer, uh, if you want to, uh, what you, you have to share, and specifically, I know in 2009, GAO made, I think, 13 specific recommendations on this issue that maybe overlap or complement what Mr. Blair just referenced. Um, where do you think we are on those 13 specific recommendations uh, and, and which, if any, that are not been followed that are most important that we, we talk about? Uh, Congressman Platt, I will get you the specifics on the 13 recommendations okay. for the record, though. Uh, but just to add to what Mr. Easton and Mr. Blair have mentioned, our main concern is, again, that not 
all the transactions, especially about commercial pay, were included in the risk assessment calculation for internal uh, for improper payments. Um, also, uh, improper payments uh, is an area which is self-reported, and given the control environment uh, within DOD itself, it may not be a complete number. Uh, like we testified yesterday, that um, it, funds control and payments control is an issue that GEO is concerned about the completeness of the reporting of the anti-deficiency violations and the improper payments. So the lack of controls may not provide a complete picture uh, to the officials within DOD from which they are reporting. The um, question, um, I mean, the fact that we have improper payments at all, and especially in billions of dollars, goes to the in internal control issue. Um, years back when we um, created the Department of Homeland Security, uh, this, this subcommittee, Mr. Towns and I, worked, and um, we pushed through a actual audit on their internal controls to try to get bedrock in that new department so then we could the feedback we've gotten from the department is that was great for them because of it really got them a, a good place to then build on uh, I, I know the challenge would be dramatically greater here with the budget uh, you know probably 13 times or so DHS's um, so is it unrealistic of, of that type of approach here uh, or some variation to try to get to bedrock on the internal control issue that relates to improper payments and, and you know, ultimately to that clean audit. One of the one of the uh, uh, the areas that I think that I can point to in the past that have, have indicated why we haven't made progress is that we've looked at it from just a financial management per perspective and we've looked at it in narrow slices. What we've tried to do is to integrate internal controls, particularly internal controls over financial reporting, into the into this plan. And so we're trying to do as part of this plan do this. So we're not going to go after just after improper payments or problem disbursements. We need to go after a good foundation to be able to build upon. So yeah, I, mean, I if, think that we're trying to do that. I mean, because if you get there, that addresses the improper payments as well as giving you, you know, you know time-sensitive information, you know, as far as how you manage your resources, how you shift them between priorities. Um, you know, so there's a whole host of benefits, including improper payments. Absolutely. And we're trying to, there's a couple paradigms that I think that we're trying to shift and teach ourselves. Uh, you know, one is the difference between positive assurance and negative assurance. And, and both of these gentlemen have taught me well over the last several years is what we seek is positive assurance, to be able to say this is why management is confident. And then, because problems will happen in an enterprise as large as, as large as the Department of Defense, but at the same time a sound basis of internal controls increases the likelihood that will find a problem and deal with it quickly, but it also increases the credibility of, of those admittedly self-reported numbers. Okay. Um, Mr. Towns, you, you, you. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Let me ask, is, is the problem that you have not been able to make a decision whether you want to use more outside auditors and uh, or to hire inside uh, folks to be able to do it. I mean, because when I look at the fact that you have these 2,200 different systems, I mean, is, is that part of the, the, the problem? I'm trying to figure out how we get past that or what precipitated it. I think that we, I, I, I like to think of this as is, is, uh, Henry Ford. Uh, you know, waking up, uh, you know, he, he, he was managing Ford Motor Company uh, out of his pocket uh, as an individual proprietorship with no requirement to get a clean opinion, and then all of a sudden he's a multinational uh, corporation. We have evolved over many years, and so those systems that have evolved, many of the systems, we don't have nearly that many financial systems, but we have that many systems feeding our financial numbers. And so part of this process that will enable us is to, is to increase, you know, reduce the number of systems, improve the level of standardization. It will make an audit not only doable but also affordable. And so that's what we seek to do. I think that we got there just through evolution more than anything else and organizationally and growing without a thought process of this, you know, prior to the CFO Act. But that would be my uh, assessment, sir. One of the most pressing issues with uh, DOD financial management system has been that they are low-tech. In your testimony, you note 
that many of these systems exchange information slowly and inaccurately, lack controls, and are non-standard. It appears as if you have begun to remedy these problems by overhauling the system. I am especially encouraged by your recognition that these systems must be designed with a holistic rather than a stovepipe approach. Um, can you describe what this holistic approach to IT system comprises? What does it constitute? I, I think that what we would describe that as, as being able to develop a, uh, a, a framework for how we want to do business. That framework is embodied in our enterprise architecture. And, and, and this is a relatively new uh, invention. We be begun on this around 2001. We have an enterprise architecture that is, is essentially a set of end-to-end -end processes of how we would want to do business. And so what we are trying to do is to take the systems that we are investing in, oftentimes a commercial off-the-shelf system, to ensure that it is complying with that set of ground rules. Uh, that is how we are trying to uh, evolve and, and be able to deal with it on a, on a holistic basis. Right. Let me ask this question and I am going to yield back. Um, is there anything that we can do on this side uh, that we are not doing that would be helpful? I, I think and I know you are not going to recommend more hearings, but anyway, I, I, I understand I, that. I, 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 probably my boss would shoot me. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but I think, uh, I think that sessions like this, your interest uh, uh, is very, very important. Uh, and, and I think that uh, uh, Mr. Blair and Mr. Khan mentioned that. That kind of focus, I think, does in fact help keep us focused. As I look back and I mentioned being in the, uh, in the Pentagon in the mid-'90s, uh, and these kinds of hearings occurred, but they did not occur with the frequency, uh, the knowledgeable intent and focus that we see them occurring now. And from my perspective, uh, that is very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Easton. I don't want to say that I want to be up here on a regular basis testifying, um, but I think the tone from the top is very important to keeping the pressure on. Uh, other types of reporting um, sometimes become helpful tools to prod the department to do certain things by certain points in time. And so you may want to look at uh, some, some interim reporting mechanisms to closely track the milestones and where they are slipping. And I, I know that there is already some of those reporting requirements. But I think between the two of those, the, the continued pressure and the tone from the top, as well as the reporting, along with the sustained leadership that the Department has in, in, in place and a sustained, consistent direction of how we are going to fix this problem, I think we are in a better situation now to, to see real improvement than we have been in the past. Just to add to what Mr. Blair and Mr. Easton have said, uh, GAO has highlighted that oversight and investment management in IT projects or ERP um, implementation is essential. Uh, by that, I mean that when the ERPs are being implemented, they are moving to a next phase, they should be more question asked, that the ERP is meeting the intended functionality. Uh, like I have mentioned in my testimony, many of the ERPs have slipped their timing or their timelines because they were not meeting their functionality. So strengthening the oversight and investment management is critical. Though we are seeing positive signs, and one of the ones, if I may highlight, is uh, the Milestone Decision Authority recently uh, uh, precluded DEEMS, which is the Air Force um, General Ledger System, from being deployed further from the Scots Air Force Base until the, um, some of their implementation problems were addressed. So we are seeing some positive signs, but that is a critical area where they need to strengthen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Mr. Langford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, who is kind of living and breathing this all the time? Is there an individual or a group of individuals? Obviously, you all obviously live with it a lot. Uh, but someone has got to wake up every morning thinking, how am I going to fix contracting? How am I going to fix training contracting officers? How are we going to chase this down? Somebody has got to wake up thinking, when is the last time we went down to the line and talked to civilian employees uh, about waste? Uh, when is the last time I sat down with a warfighter and said, how do we really get receipts back? Uh, when is the last time that we actually sat down with a contractor 
and said, did this work, and getting feedback and evaluation and gathering those ideas on the ground. So who is kind of living and breathing that all the time? It's, it, it takes place at a lot of levels. I guess if I, I feel like I wake up thinking about it all the time. Clearly, I've got a, I've got a, a leader for, for my fire team. I hired him from, with experience in financial audit uh, to be able to do that. It really goes down into the field. And when I, when I visit the field, I am, quite frankly, more encouraged uh, because those kinds of things are happening. Uh, but we need to make sure that they happen within the context of these kinds of outcomes. Right. So is, is there, um, as far as comparing agencies, for instance, I have heard very high praise on Veterans Affairs and how they are handling some of their training of their contracting officers. Is there that kind of conversation happening agency to agency? Or maybe you all would look at it and say, I disagree. I you don't think they are doing a good job either. But you all may have a different opinion on that from what I am hearing. Uh, but is there that kind of conversation agency to agency saying, how are you training people? Uh, it is something that we are trying to deal with as well as the training and the equipping of the contracting officer. There's, there's forums. I can speak to forums. For, you know, OMB sponsors a CFO council. There's, a, there's a, a, an analogous uh, a group with, for the acquisition community and the HR community. Oftentimes, it's important to not only have those convi you know, conversations across the functional areas, but then within the organizations, because these things really do uh, ha you know, have to fit together from an enterprise perspective. But those are, at least that's an example I could point to. Okay. Any comments on that? Uh, just to add to that, I mean, if we, uh, it is very important to look at the financial management within the context of the business transformation or the enterprise transformation within DOD itself. So, uh, just like Mr. Blair and Mr. Easton have mentioned, it has to be a multifunctional approach so that we avoid some of the siloed uh, initiatives in the earlier days. So, con consequently, acquisitions, uh, uh, procurement acquisitions, supply chain management, infrastructure. Uh, development all has to be looked at collectively to be able to address these issues. Okay. While, while we're talking back and forth, too, there, there are several comments that are made, and Mr. Easton has part of his testimony a section about recovering uh, uh, improper payments and such. Uh, obviously, that's important when we discover that's an improper payment to recover. It is a part of this conversation as well. How do we prevent those improper payments ever being done, and how is how are we doing on the progress on that? Mr. Langford, I think that is the, is the key. Don't try to recover the money once it's gone out the door, but try to prevent it up front. Right. And, and that's what all the discussion this morning has been on focusing on internal controls. And when the Department has a solid set of internal controls that provide the positive assurance that Mr. Easton in the, uh, referred to earlier, when that is in place, then the number of improper payments is going to significantly decline. And so it is very important for the Department to improve its internal control structure first rather than to emphasize trying to recover the money after it's already gone out the door. But, but, but I might add that we have emphasized uh, prepayment checks. In fact, in, in, when, when GAO uh, came in, and that was our position, is that, is that we would prefer to invest in, in, in stopping before. And, and I think that GAO position was, well, you, you should do both. Uh, and that's that's what we're currently doing with commercial payments. But we had a, a, a business activity monitoring tool, an automated tool that was particularly critical because we had multiple entitlement systems, and so potentially a vendor could submit as a as a weakness could submit an invoice to two different systems, and we had to make sure that we are able to address that, address it before something like that happens, and it's produced good results. That's great. One one final question for me, then I'd be glad to be able to yield back. Uh, we're obviously gearing up for a large-scale single audit happening six years from now, on time, ready to go, well checked, all those wonderful things. What about 2017, 18, 19? Uh, are the systems and the process and the conversation in place to say this is not going to be gear up for 20 years to get the check and then we will do this again 20 years from now? Or are these systems all gearing up and saying we will be prepared for an annual check from here on out? I think we certainly understand that this is a this is an annual routine. This is not again from a OS from a Department of Defense cultural perspective. Oftentimes, you get into, in my experience in uniform, you get into where you in one particular tour you would experience an inspection, one time. Uh, I spoke to a group of Marines, uh, and as we go through this, the audit of the Marine Corps statement of budgetary resources, a young Marine raised his hand and said. Sir, you mean we have to do this every year? And the answer is absolutely. But the key to being able to do it every year, and, and as the chairman mentioned, the sustainability aspect is really based in 
on the scale we operate, systems and strong internal controls. And so that is what we have to, uh, we have to be able to be building now. Culture change. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Forgive me for uh, being uh, late. I had a, an amendment on the floor. Um, Mr. Easton, um, Congress first required DOD to audit its finances in 1997. How much has the DOD budget increased since 1997? I don't have the specific numbers off the top of my head, but significantly increased, particularly in the last 10 years since right. 2001. Probably doubled, right? Yes, sir. Plus wars. And so presumably it is more imperative than ever, given the huge amounts of money we are talking about, that in fact uh, DOD meet that requirement. Now we are talking about extending it to 2017, which means we will have gone 20 years from the first congressional requirement to the actual deadline. From a confidence building point of view, you think that is a problem for the Department of Defense? I think we know why we are not financially auditable. I wish that, and as was mentioned earlier, Secretary Panetta has publicly said he finds it unacceptable, as do we. Uh, we have a plan. The complexity of what we need to do, and I venture to say that in 1997, the Department of Defense did not fully understand what it meant to become financially auditable. We do now. We have a plan, and I think we're committed to it. I wish we could deliver it tomorrow, uh, but it will take time. And I think that we're on the right track. Good. Well, I, I just I think on both sides of the aisle. Uh, we share the same view that uh, it is imperative that, that that be accomplished sooner rather than later in order to make sure there is public confidence in the vast amounts of money we are investing in defense. Um, DOD has 2,200 noninteroperable business management systems. And I know that Mr. Towns asked a question about this, but what progress are we achieving on trying to get that number down? Uh, to ensure more efficiency and more accountability? We are making significant progress. I think which, with each of, these, um, which each of these major systems, enterprise resource planning systems, there is not just one or two, but there is tens of, uh, you know, near, you know in the Navy ERP, for example, when it was implemented uh, at the Naval Air uh, Systems Command, uh, eliminated 60 systems. And so we have uh, significant ways to go, but we are making progress with each implementation at each individual activity. I hope so. Um, DOD spends more than, given the fact that it has got the largest budget, it spends more than any other Federal agency on outsourcing contracts. Um, contract management, especially given the growth in the budget since, that we talked about since 1997, uh, obviously becomes even more important. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the role of training contract managers and whether we have looked at ways to create a professional uh, path that is more attractive and, more, and, and longer lasting so there is continuity built into large, long-run contracts? The the, uh, the acquisition community uh, has developed, and I think that under DEWIA, under the Acquisition Workforce Act, has developed a framework to be able to uh, develop a career pattern, to be able to develop those capabilities. Quite frankly, within the financial management community, we are trying to model that uh, under the, the same kind of thing. But uh, training and awareness uh, not only of, of directly contract administration, but issues associated with the financial weaknesses associated with the gaps uh, need to be included in that training. So I would absolutely agree. Yeah, I, I, I just had, and maybe Mr. Blair or Mr. Cohen wants to comment, but I, I just got to tell you, as somebody who came from the federal contracting world till I came here, uh, I can remember one contract, not your agency, uh, in which uh, we had 14 managers in like a three-year period no continuity. Uh, everyone had different expectations of what the contract really meant. Everyone had their own informal ways of changing scope. And cumulatively, by the end of the contract, it had radically changed the nature of the contract. And, and it is very difficult for a conscientious contractor to try to provide quality service when the client, frankly, is so changeable. 
Mr. Blair, Mr. Kahn, uh, if the Chair would indulge, any comments on the, the whole contracting piece? Uh, Mr. Connolly, I think you identified a, a key part of the Department's um, business processes that has to improve. So much of what the Department does on a day-to-day -day basis, it executes through contracts. Those contracts have to be well-defined in the beginning. The requirements have to be well-established in the beginning. And equally important, throughout the life of the contract, there has to be effective contract oversight so that the Department actually knows that it is getting what it pays for. Um, the more improvement that the Department can put in place in the requirements and the oversight, uh, the better off we are going to be to know that we are effectively spending our money. Just to add to what Mr. Blair said, uh, like I had mentioned earlier on, that a lot of these financial management or transactions, they originate in contracting and procurement. Uh, therefore, I am just stepping away a little bit from contractor training from a contract execution perspective, but it is very important for the contracting personnel to have the training so that they enter the financial information correctly in the systems because uh, if it is not entered correctly, then correcting and rectifying it downstream, it is a challenge without reworking it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, um, I want to thank you for holding a substantive non-gotcha hearing which, of course, characterizes your leadership in this subcommittee. So, well, thank you, Mr. Connolly. And um, I, as I said uh, earlier, that the, um, uh, the issues we deal with because accounting and things is not the most uh, exciting but very important, and uh, your participation as well as uh, Mr. Lankford and the ranking member is, uh, is much appreciated. Um, my understanding, we, we're probably going to have first vote go up in, in five to ten minutes which um, means we have a chance to squeeze in a, a few more questions if we could and, and maybe have one quick opportunity for each of uh, my colleagues as well to wrap up. Um, and uh, we, we, we will likely follow up with you in writing a, a number of issues I know we're not going to get to. Um, and and uh, that's a credit to the written statements that you provided, which gave a lot of good detail and your testimony here today to give us a good ability to have an exchange. Um, I want to make sure I get in about the uh, issue that's been mentioned a number of times and uh, the training and the sustainability um, and that the systems we put in place and it goes to Mr. Langford that we don't just have 2017 and oh, we're good for 20 years and see what happens. But we, our goal is that when we get to 2017 that we have a workforce that's well trained and, and fully up to speed uh, and moving forward with uh, the fire uh, you know, um, uh, guidelines. Uh, to have that audit uh, be a clean audit and thereafter uh, be able to do so. But the other is the systems we put in place and information technology. Um, when I first came on to this committee just as a, a ranking member, I mean, as a, as a member and then uh, began to chair it in January 2003, we were in the initial years of, of dimers. Uh, the defense, in, uh, defense Integrated uh, Military Human Resource System. And it was promised as the savior of how it was going to help us get our hands around this uh, you know, personnel, uh, human resource systems uh, in particular, and all the expenditures related to it. Um, last year, after uh, I think 12 years of expenditures, uh, over a billion dollars, it was basically cast aside. That uh, Admiral Mullen, Chief, uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, uh, quoted as saying it's uh, a disaster. Um, I know there is a draft report that GAO has, has put out uh, entitled the Information Technology OMB Needs to Improve Its Guidance on IT Investments. In that draft report from GAO, it references that in the fiscal year 2011 expenditures that government-wide uh, is uh, just shy of $79 billion in planned IT investments of which almost half of those, $37 billion, are Defense Department IT investments. And, and I think if I do my numbers correctly, maybe uh, uh, two-thirds are uh, operations and maintenance of existing systems, and a third is new investments. Given the history of dimers um, and a billion dollars of hard-earned taxpayer funds spent without a good return or perhaps any return in the end, what are we doing to make sure that that $37 billion we are spending this year, some on existing, some on, on new investments, that we have learned the lessons of dimers 
and that we are not getting far down the path and say, you know what, this isn't going to do what we need to do, and we start over again. And Mr. Easton, if you, if you could take that. We are trying to uh, apply the lessons, and I think that we are very deliberate, and there is a balance between, between holding these programs up and making sure that we are going to get our money's worth. But Dimers is the, is the classic example uh, of something that we cannot afford to repeat. And in many cases, uh, we, uh, number one, we are trying to leverage uh, something from the Dimers program. I certainly hope that we can. I don't know for sure if we will. Uh, but uh, in at least one instance, one of the uh, the components is is stopping to say we're not sure we need a large system. You know, we, we're not sure that we can make you know with a smaller investment to be able to get the capabilities. It starts with applying the lessons and also ensuring that the specific problem that we're trying to solve and the specific functional advocate that's that's thinking about this all the time is involved, and we don't just put this into a program and just expect things to happen. And so, you know, we are trying to apply that in our investment review process to be able to make sure that that never happens again. In that review process, um, to, to learn the lessons, not repeat them, the other issue is when, you, when you, I see the number 37 billion of perhaps maybe a third of which is new investment, are you also looking at making sure you are not being duplicative uh, in those investments, that there is a, a, a cross the department coordination of, of what you are doing, both that you are not duplicating efforts and that whatever different efforts are out there in the end will be able to, to talk to each other and coord be coordinated you know, for the overall uh, assessment. I co-chair co uh, an investment review board that partners with uh, weapons systems acquisition logistics. And I think that that makes sense because in many cases we have said that we spend a lot of money in, in acquisition and logistics support functions. We ask those specific questions as, as systems come up to us for approval, whether it's a legacy system or a, or a system that has to be modernized. If there's a, it's this question of you know why does the Air Force have this system and the Navy has the same system to do the same thing, and we've been able to make some successes, but admittedly that still that mindset is that everyone's special and we're trying to be able to to do that and minimize that uh, investment. I should say as we go through the current budget process, we're getting a lot of help we're, in terms of reducing the the amount of money. Uh, that is that is invested in the business systems, and so we're going to have to make some hard decisions in that regard as well. Uh, Mr. Blair, um, as we go forward and, and have the lessons of Dimers, and I know um, your office plays a role in auditing and kind of after the fact, but also proactive. What role does the IG uh, have in looking at those investment decisions, you know, proactively and prospectively? So it's you know upfront that you can help make sure the lessons learned are applied? One of the things that, that we have ongoing right now are, are several audits of the ERP systems. And we are going to be starting in fiscal year 12 doing audits of additional ERP systems. And, and it is important to note that these audits are not tail end um, gotcha type things you should have done 10 years ago. What we are really doing uh, as the systems are being developed and as they are being rolled out in a staged manner, we are looking at the current scenario for the system and saying, here are some areas that we think you need to correct before you roll it out any further. Um, GFIBs and LMP are two examples of systems where we have done a lot of audit work. And what I think is encouraging is the dialogue that Mr. Easton and I have had over the past several weeks, especially on these systems and how lessons learned can be taken from those ERPs to the other ERPs that are being developed so that the information that we are providing to them on one particular system can then be mm -hmm. used to, to leverage and improve the, uh, the rollout of other systems. Okay. And, and Ms. Khan, has GAO, um, I know, has done a lot of work in this area of, of the investments that have been made, done anything comprehensive that, that, that captures how much has been invested in IT uh, in, in the broad sense, but specifically DOD, that was not productive? Uh, and, and what um, the consequences of those failed investments were? Yeah, Mr. Platts, I mean, we haven't gone down to that granular level of uh, whether it's been productive or not. We did do a body of work last year which was focused on 10 business-related ERPs, and it was of concern there were cost uh, overruns and time slippages, and we had made several recommendations. And like I had mentioned earlier on to Mr. Towns' question, we have seen some positive signs, and we hope we continue to see them. In terms of uh, investment management and milestone decisions, 
Uh, an example I gave you was the Air Force's general ledger system where the milestone decision authority had made a decision to not give them permission to deploy that outside of Scott's Air Force Base till the current functionality was addressed. Yeah. So, but there needs to be more um, oversight and um, hard questions to be asked before additional funding is given. Uh, the, um, uh, I want to wrap up there because I, I know the votes are up and if uh, Mr. Towns, if um, Mr. Connolly, do you have any other question that we? Uh, I just said yeah. just one. Yeah. May, yeah. Um, thank you. As you know, uh, we bifurcate federal contracting training between the Defense Acquisition University and the Federal Acquisition Institute. Unfortunately, the FAI has only six employees and nowhere near the capacity to train contracting staff as needed by non-defense agencies. Do you believe FAI could perhaps take some object lessons from how uh, DAU operates and are there opportunities from your point of view perhaps to scale up FAI in, a coordina in coordination with DAU? I'm afraid I'd have to take that for the record uh, I, and look into that uh, from an acquisition perspective. I'd be glad to do that. I would welcome that. Thank you, Mr. Easton. Mr. Kahn, GAO, got any point of view about that? I, uh, I do not. I don't think we have looked at it. Um, I will take that for the record if there is any yeah, yeah, work going. that we have done. I would just note for the record <laughs> that uh, we got a letter from Dan Gordon from OMB, very strange letter, uh, given the fact that I am the author of the legislation, try to scale up FAI. Uh, indicating that uh, we really didn't need to do much and we already were doing a fine job. That's not true. It's shocking to me that uh, OMB would send such a letter without at least first consulting with the author of the legislation. Uh, and um, I can just assure you this member of Congress is going to aggressively continue to pursue trying to scale up FAI so that we have contracting, skilled contracting managers in place to manage complex, large, often systems integration type contracts for other Federal agencies besides DOD. Uh, and I would appreciate you taking that word back. Thank you so much. Th thank the gentleman. Um, there are a whole host of issues that we didn't get to, uh, but we are going to need to wrap up here. And, and uh, my understanding from the rank members, we have 14 votes, so we will not be asking you to stay. Uh, you would have lunch and dinner and still be waiting, I think. <laughs> Um, one issue in particular that I wanted to put out there um, is the logistics modernization program with the Army. One of the things that jumped out um, in uh, Mr. Blair, your testimony about this program is that implemented, um, I think, uh, over a billion dollars again uh, invested, and yet, uh, as you say in your testimony, the system also did not resolve any of the 10 Army Working Capital Fund internal control weaknesses. That is where well, I want to believe you, Mr. Easton, that, you know, why should we, you know, this time think, hey, we are going to get it right. When I look at that, it, it, it makes me think we are back at Dimers seven years ago, that we are spending a lot of money and we are not actually achieving the success we need. So I um, want that to be on the radar, uh, you know, that, again, that is a, a concern. Um, the uh, a final comment would be uh, we are grateful for all three of you and your uh, colleagues that are working hand in hand with you uh, on this important issue. And as Mr. Langford said, you know we have the the, the best military in the world, and uh, is tremendous in defending this country. If we can get these issues right, we'll have a greater ability to uh, provide the, the resources that that military needs uh, to continue its heroic efforts uh, on behalf of our nation. And and. I know each of you share this perspective that we really are about not um, that heroic effort to get a check, but to put in place long-term solutions so that this is a systemic change in the mindset of the personnel, in the systems in place, um, in every aspect that 2017 will be the start of a long history of DOD being able to say, we know how much money we got. We know where it's going, how it was used, um, year in and year out, day in and day out, because that will better serve all the managers in DOD who are using those resources for the good of the, of the military personnel. Um, we look forward to continuing to, uh, to work with each of you and your offices and going forward. Uh, as I said, Mr. Towns and I have been partnering on this issue for um, 
almost a decade now, and um, hopefully neither one of us is going anywhere anytime soon. We might keep trading chairs sometimes. I don't know. Um, hopefully no time, not anytime soon, uh, <laughs> changing, changing our chairs here. But um, it is something that we very much uh, believe in the importance of and uh, as good partners that we do right by the American people uh, and our military personnel and their families. So uh, we will keep the, the record open uh, for two weeks for additional information. And uh, thank you again for your testimony. This uh, hearing stands adjourned.